Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 1 Fear I've always thought of myself as a coward. Most of my memories of my childhood involve me being afraid in some way. Afraid of other kids, afraid of being hurt or embarrassed, afraid of being seen as weak. But mostly, I was afraid of my father. When I was nine years old, I watched my father punch my mother in the side of her head so hard that she collapsed. I saw her spit blood. That moment in that bedroom, probably more than any other moment in my life, has defined who I am today. Within everything that I have done since then, the awards and accolades, the spotlights and the attention, the characters and the laughs, there has been a subtle string of apologies to my mother for my inaction that day, for failing her in that moment, for failing to stand up to my father, for being a coward. What you have come to understand as Will Smith, the alien annihilating MC, the bigger than life movie star, is largely a construction. A carefully crafted and honed character designed to protect myself, to hide myself from the world, to hide the coward. My father was my hero. His name was Willard Carroll Smith, but we all called him Daddy-O. Daddy-O was born and raised in the rough and rugged streets of North Philadelphia in the 1940s. Daddy-O's father, my grandfather, owned a small fish market. He had to work from 4 a.m. until late at night every day. My grandmother was a nurse and often worked the night shift at the hospital. As a result, Daddy-O spent much of his childhood alone and unsupervised. The North Philly streets had a way of hardening you. You either crystallized into a mean mother, or the hood broke you. Daddy-O was smoking cigarettes by 11 and drinking by the age of 14. My father developed a defiant and aggressive attitude that would continue all his life. When he was 14, my grandparents, fearing where his life was headed, scraped together what money they could and sent him to an agricultural boarding school in the Pennsylvania countryside, where kids learned farming techniques and basic handyman work. It was a strict and traditional place, and by sending him there, they hoped to introduce some much-needed structure and discipline into his life. But nobody was going to tell my father what to do. Other than working on some of the tractor engines, he couldn't be bothered with what he described as that hillbilly bull. <coughs> he would skip classes, he smoked cigarettes, and kept on drinking. At age 16, Daddy-O was done with this school and ready to go home. He decided to get himself kicked out. He started disrupting classes, ignoring all the rules, and antagonizing anyone in a position of authority. But when the administrators tried to send him home, my grandparents refused to take him back. We paid for the full year, they said. You're getting paid to deal with him, so deal with him. Daddy-O was stuck. But Daddy-O was a hustler. He was going to find his way out. On his 17th birthday, he snuck off campus, walked half a dozen miles to the nearest recruiting office, and enlisted in the United States Air Force. This was classic Daddy-O. He was so hell-bent on defying authority and rebelling against both of his parents and the school that he jumped out of the frying pan of an agricultural boarding school and directly into the fire of the US military. He ended up in the exact structure and discipline my grandparents had desperately hoped to instill in him. But as it turned out, Daddy-O loved it. It was in the military that he discovered the transformative power of order and discipline, two values that he came to worship as the guardrails protecting him from the worst parts of himself. Waking up at 4 a.m., train all morning, work all day, study all night, he found his lane. He discovered that he could outlast anybody, and he began to take pride in that. It was another aspect of his defiant attitude. 
Nobody could force him to wake up with a bugle horn because he already was up. With his passionate work ethic, boundless energy, and undeniable intelligence, he should have quickly risen through the ranks, but there were two issues. First, he had a brutal temper, and superior officer or not, if you were wrong, he wasn't doing it. Second, his drinking. Let me tell you, my father was one of the smartest people I've ever known, but when he was angry or drunk, he became an idiot. He would break his own rules, subvert his own objectives, destroy his own things. After about two years in the military, this self-destructive streak peaked through the veil of order and ended his service career. One night, he and the guys from his platoon were gambling. daddy was sweet with a pair of dice. He took those dudes for almost a thousand dollars. Once he'd stashed the winnings in his footlocker, he headed out to get something to eat, but when he returned from the mess hall, the guys had stolen back the money. In his fury, daddy drank himself into a frenzy, took out his service pistol, and lit up the barracks. Nobody got hurt, but it was enough for the Air Force to show him the door. He was fortunate that he wasn't court-martialed. Instead, they just discharged him, put him on a bus, and invited him to never come back. This was a tension that ripped through my father's entire life. He demanded such rigid perfection from himself and the people around him, yet after too many drinks, or if he snapped, he would burn everything to the ground. Daddy-O moved back to Philly. Undaunted, he took a job in a steel mill while putting himself through night school. He studied engineering and showed a real aptitude for both electricity and the science of refrigeration. One day, after being passed over for a promotion at the steel mill for the third or fourth time because of his race, he simply walked out the door and never went back. He knew refrigeration, so he decided he'd start his own business. Daddy-O was brilliant. Like many sons, I worshipped my father but he also terrified me. He was one of the greatest blessings of my life and also one of my greatest sources of pain. My mom was born Carolyn Elaine Bright. She's a Pittsburgh girl, born and raised in Homewood, a predominantly black neighborhood on the east side of the city. My mother, AKA Mom Mom, is eloquent and sophisticated she has a petite frame with long, elegant piano player's fingers, perfectly sized to deliver a gorgeous rendition of Fur Elisa. She has been a standout student at Westinghouse High School and was one of the first black women to ever study at Carnegie Mellon University. Mom Mom would often say that knowledge was the only thing that the world couldn't take away from you, and she only cared about three things. Education, education, and education. She loved business. Banking, finance, sales, contracts. Mom Mom always had her own money. Life moved quickly for my mother, as it often did in those days. She married her first husband at the age of 20, had a daughter, and was divorced less than three years later. By 25, as a struggling single mom, she was probably one of the most educated African-American women in all of Pittsburgh, yet she was still working jobs beneath the level of her true potential. Feeling trapped and craving bigger opportunities, she packed up the baby and moved to live with her mother, my grandmother Gigi, in Philadelphia. My parents met in the summer of 1964. Mom Mom was working as a notary in the Fidelity Bank in Philly. She was rolling out with some girlfriends to a party, and one of them told her she just had to meet this man. His name was Will Smith. In many ways, Mom Mom is the total opposite of my father. Whereas Daddia was the boisterous, charismatic center of attention, Mom Mom is quiet and reserved. Not because she's shy or intimidated, but because she only speaks when it improves on silence. 
She loves words and always chooses them carefully. She speaks with an academic sophistication. Daddy-o, on the other hand, was loud, spewing the lingo of a 1950s North Philly hood rat. He loved the poetry of his profanity. I once heard him call a man a dirty rat <coughs> sucking low-down mangy pig er. Mom-mom doesn't use profanity. It's important to note here that back in the day, Daddy-o was the man. Six foot two, smart, good looking, the proud owner of a fire engine red convertible Pontiac. He was funny, he could sing, he could play the guitar. He could lock people into him. He was always the dude standing in the middle of a party with a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other. A master storyteller who could keep a room buzzing. When Mom Mom first saw Daddy-O, he reminded her of a tall Marvin Gaye. He was savvy and knew his way around people. He could talk his way into a party, get free drinks and a table near the front. Daddy-O had a way of moving through the world like everything was under control. It was all going to be fine. This was comforting for my mom. My mother's memory of their first days together is just a blurred montage of restaurants and clubs strung together by a stream of jokes and laughter. Mom, mom couldn't get over how funny he was, but most important to her, he was ambitious. He had his own business. He had employees. He wanted to work in white neighborhoods with white people working for him. Daddy-o was going places. My father wasn't used to interacting with women of my mother's educational accomplishments. Man, this bird's smart as a mother, <coughs> he thought. Daddy-o was the street smarts to Mom Mom's book smarts. My parents had a lot in common, too. They both had a passion for music. They loved jazz, blues, and later, funk and R&B. They lived through the glorious Motown days and spent much of it dancing together in musty basement parties and jazz clubs. But there were strange commonalities as well. The stuff that startles you and makes you think, this must be God's plan. Both of my parents had mothers who were nurses who worked night shifts. One was Helen, one was Ellen. Both of my parents had short-lived marriages in their early 20s, and they both had daughters. And in perhaps the strangest coincidence, they had both their daughters named Pam. My parents got married in a small ceremony at Niagara Falls in 1966. Soon after, Daddy-o moved into my grandmother Gigi's house on North 54th Street in West Philadelphia. It wasn't long before they combined their very different strengths and talents into an effective team. Mom Mom ran Daddy-O's office. Payroll, contracts, taxes, accounting, permits, and Daddy-O got to do what he did best. Work hard and make money. Both of my parents would later speak fondly of those early years. They were young, in love, ambitious, and they were moving on up. My full name is Willard Carroll Smith II, not Junior. Daddy-o would always correct people. Hey, he ain't no mother, <coughs> Junior. He felt like calling me Junior diminished both of us. I was born on September 25th, 1968. My mom says that from the moment I showed up, I was a talker. Always smiling, yapping, and babbling away, content to just be making noise. Gigi worked the graveyard shift at Jefferson Hospital in Center City, Philadelphia, so she'd take care of me in the mornings while my parents were at work. Her house had a huge porch, which served as my front row seat to the drama of North 54th Street and a stage on which I could join in the theatrics. She'd prop me up on that porch and watch me jibber-jabber with anybody and everybody who walked by. Even at that age, I loved having an audience. 
My twin brother and sister, Harry and Ellen, were born on May 5th, 1971. And counting Mom Mom's daughter Pam, just like that there would now be six of us under one roof. Fortunately, the North Philly entrepreneur in Daddio was alive and well. He had gone from repairing refrigerators to installing and maintaining refrigerator and freezer cases in major supermarkets. Business was taking off. He was expanding beyond Philly into the surrounding suburbs. He started to build a fleet of trucks and hire a crew of refrigeration and electrical technicians. He also rented a small building to use as his base of operations. daddy -o was always hustling. I remember one particularly frigid winter, cash got tight, so he taught himself how to repair kerosene heaters. They were all the rage in Philly at the time. He put up a bunch of flyers and people started bringing him their broken heaters. daddy -o figured out that once he'd fix the heater, he'd have to test it for a couple days to make sure it was working. At any given time, he'd have 10 or 12 kerosene heaters being tested for the quality of his work. That many heaters will easily warm a West Philly row home, even in the coldest of winters. So daddy -o canceled our gas service, kept his family warm and toasty for the winter, and got paid for it. By the time that I was two years old, daddy -o had established his business firmly enough to buy a house about a mile away from Gigi in a middle-class neighborhood of West Philly called Winefield. I grew up at 5943 Woodcrest Avenue on a tree-lined street of 30 grayish-red brick row homes, all connected. The physical proximity of the houses cultivated a strong sense of community. It also meant that if your neighbor had roaches, you had roaches too. Everybody knew everybody. For a young black family in the 1970s, this was as American dream as you could get. Across the street was Bieber Middle School and its majestic concrete playground. Basketball, baseball, girls jumping double dutch, the old head slap boxing, and the second the summer hit, Pop goes the water plug. Our neighborhood was thick with kids, and we were always outside playing. Living within 100 yards of my house, there were almost 40 kids my age. Stacy, David, Reese, Cherry, Michael, Teddy, Sean, Omar, and on and on. And that's not even counting their siblings, or the kids on the next blocks. Stacy Brooks is my oldest friend in the world. We met the day my family moved to Woodcrest. I was two, she was three. Our mothers pushed our strollers up to each other and introduced us. I was in love with her by the time I was seven, but she was in love with David Brandon. He was nine. Times were good, and people were clearly having sex. A lot. My middle class upbringing contributed to the constant criticism I took early in my rap career. I was not a gangster, and I wasn't selling drugs. I grew up on a nice street in a two-parent household. I went to a Catholic school with mostly white kids until I was 14. My mom was college educated, and for all of his faults, my father always put food on the table and would die before he abandoned his kids. My story was very different from the ones being told by the young black men who were launching the global phenomenon that would later become hip-hop. In their minds, I was somehow an illegitimate artist. They would call me soft, whack, corny, a bubblegum rapper, criticism that violently infuriated me. Looking back, I realize I may have been projecting a little. But the reason I hated it so much was that they were unknowingly poking at the thing I mostly hated about myself. My sense that I was a coward. daddy -o saw the world in terms of commanders and missions. A military mindset that informed every aspect of his life. He would come to run our family as though we were a platoon on a battlefield and the Woodcrest house was our barracks. 
He didn't ask us to clean our rooms or to make our beds. He commanded, police your area. In his world, there was no such thing as a small thing. Doing your homework was a mission. Cleaning the bathroom was a mission. Getting groceries from the supermarket was a mission. And scrubbing the floor? It was never just about scrubbing a floor. It was about your ability to follow orders, to exhibit self-discipline, and to complete a task with the utmost perfection. 99% is the same as zero, was one of his favorite sayings. If a soldier failed his or her mission, it had to be repeated until perfected. And to disobey a command meant you faced a court-martial. And the punishment usually came in the form of a belt to your bare... <laughs> He'd say, take him off, I ain't gonna beat my clothes. In daddy -O's mind, everything was life or death. He was preparing his children to thrive in a harsh world, a world that he saw as chaotic and brutal. The instilling of fear was, and still is to a large degree, a cultural parenting tactic in the black community. Fear is embraced as a survival necessity. It is a widely held belief that in order to protect black children, they must fear parental authority. The instilling of fear is viewed as an offering of love. On May 13, 1985, Daddy-O came into our rooms calling for us to get on the floor. A couple of miles south of Woodcrest, the Philadelphia Police Department had just dropped a pair of one-pound bombs on a residential neighborhood. We could hear the faint ka 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 of automatic gunfire. Five children and six adults would die that day in what is now known as the Move Bombing. Two entire city blocks, 65 homes, were burned to the ground. The news always seemed to reinforce Daddy O's point of view. Daddio's ideology was centered on training us mentally and physically to handle life's inevitable adversities, but what he unwittingly created was an environment of constant tension and anxiety. I remember one Sunday afternoon, Daddio was taking a rare day off and sitting in the living room watching TV. He called me over. Hey, Will. Popping straight to attention, I said, Yes, Daddy. Run up to Mr. Bryant's and grab my Terryton 100s. Yes, sir. He handed me $5, and I was off to the corner store. I was maybe 10 years old at the time, but this was the 1970s, back when parents could send their kids to buy cigarettes. I ran down the street directly to Mr. Bryant's without stopping, totally out of breath, a perfect soldier. Hi, Mr. Bryant. My dad sent me to pick up his cigarettes. How you doing, Will? Mr. Bryant said. They didn't come in today. Tell daddy -O they should be here tomorrow. I'll hold a carton for him. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bryant. I'll tell him. Still a good soldier, I headed home. On my way back, I ran into David and Danny Brandon, who had just gotten this weird new thing called a Nerf football. It was a football, but it was soft. Any soldier would have stopped. This thing was amazing. I got lost in the ingenuity of this extraordinary object. You could throw it in the winter, but it wouldn't hurt your fingers if you caught it. You could miss it, it could hit you in the face, and you'd be fine. One minute turned into five, and then five became ten, ten became twenty. Suddenly, David and Danny froze, their eyes locked over my shoulder. I turned and my stomach drops. Daddy-O, bare-chested, striding up the middle of the street, right at me. What the heck are you doing? David and Danny evaporated. I quickly tried to explain. Daddy, Mr. Bryant said the cigarettes didn't come in and what did I tell you to do? I know, Daddy, but it who's in charge? What do you mean, who's in charge? You or me? My heart pounding out of my chest, my voice quivers. You are, Daddy. Because if two people are in charge, everybody dies. So if you're in charge, 
Let me know because I will defer to your leadership. His nostrils flaring, the vein in his left temple pulsing madly, his eyes burn through my fragile ten-year-old innocence. When I send you on a mission, there are two possibilities. One, you complete the mission, or two, you are dead. Do you understand me? Yes, Daddy. Daddy-o grabbed me by the back of the neck and dragged me home. I didn't think I deserved a whooping for that. Most of the times I got hit during my childhood, I didn't think I'd earned it. It felt like an injustice. I wasn't the kind of kid you needed to spank. I already wanted to please you. David Brandon needed a beating. Matt Brown needed a beating. If I got in trouble, it was usually because I was distracted. I would forget something or my mind would drift. I think the corporal punishment of my childhood just convinced me I was bad. The constant fear during my childhood honed my sensitivity to every detail in my environment. From a very young age, I developed a razor-sharp intuition, an ability to attune to every emotion around me. I learned to sense anger, predict joy, and understand sadness on far deeper levels than most other kids. Recognizing these emotions was crucial and critical for my personal safety. A tone in daddy -O's voice, a pointed question from my mother, a twitch of my sister's eye. I processed these things quickly and profoundly. A misglance or misinterpreted word could quickly deteriorate into a belt on my <coughs> or a fist in my mother's face. daddy -O had a black leather key pouch hooked on his utility belt that held about 30 keys, which for me served as an alarm system. The second he'd walk through the door, you could hear his keys jingling as he placed them back into their case and reset them at his hip. I became so in tune that I could discern his mood from the rhythm and the intensity with which he handled the keys. My bedroom was at the top of the stairs, directly facing down to the front door. If he was in a good mood, they would jingle effortlessly, as though they were lighter than usual. If he was pissed, I could hear the jolt of pressure as he reattached them to his hip. And if he was drunk, the keys didn't matter. This emotional awareness had stayed with me throughout my life. Paradoxically, it has served me as an actor and performer. I could easily recognize, comprehend, and emulate complex emotions long before I knew that people would pay me for it. My father was born on the heels of the Great Depression. He was a poor black kid living on the streets of North Philly in the 1940s. He basically had a 10th grade education. Yet over the course of his life, he built a business with a dozen employees and seven trucks, selling 30,000 pounds of ice per day to grocery stores and supermarkets in three states. He went weeks without taking a day off decades without taking a vacation. My mother has memories of Daddy-O coming home in the middle of the night from the shop, dumping thousands of dollars in cash on the bed, saying, COUNT THAT, and then immediately heading out in the night to get back to work. My father tormented me, and he was also one of the greatest men I've ever known. My father was violent, but he was also at every game, play, and recital. He was an alcoholic, but he was sober at every premiere of every one of my movies. He listened to every record. He visited every studio. The same intense perfectionism that terrorized his family put food on the table every night of my life. So many of my friends grew up either not knowing their fathers or not having their fathers around. But daddy -O had my back and never abandoned his post. Not even once. And while he never learned to overcome his own demons, he would cultivate in me the tools to confront my own. As much as we all suffered under daddy -O's militaristic views of love and family, nobody suffered more than my mother. If two people being in charge meant everybody dies, then that meant my mother could never be in charge. The problem was that my mother wasn't the type of woman to be commanded. She was educated, proud, and stubborn and as much as we begged her to please be quiet, 
she refused. Once, when Daddy-O slapped her, she egged him on. Oh, you're such a man. You think that hitting a woman makes you a man, huh? He hit her again, knocking her to the ground. She stood right back up, looked him in the eye, and calmly said, Hit me all you want, but you can never hurt me. I have never forgotten that. The idea that he could hit her body, but somehow she was in control of what hurt her? I wanted to be strong like that. Everybody in my house could fight, except me. My older sister Pam was strong like our mother. She was six years older than me, and she was kind of my childhood bodyguard. She would stand up to anybody at any time. There were multiple situations where somebody would take my money or I would get bullied or come home crying and Pam would grab me by the hand, walk me straight outside and scream, WHO DID IT? Point to him, Will. Then she'd proceed to casually whoop the whole <coughs> of the unfortunate kid I pointed at. It was a sad day when she left for college. Harry turned out to be strong too. While I took extra special care to please my father every chance I got, Harry mimicked my mother's behavior. Starting at a young age, he preferred to just stand up and take the beatings. He once yelled at my father, You can hit me, but you can't make me cry. Smack! I'm not crying. Smack! I'm not crying. Eventually, realizing he couldn't break him, Daddy-O laid off Harry altogether. All along, Harry's courage, the fact that my little brother was able to stand up to the monster, just reinforced my shame. In a family of fighters, I was the weak one. I was the coward. In acting, understanding a character's fears is a critical part of understanding his or her psyche. The fears create desires, and the desires precipitate actions. These repetitive actions and predictable responses are the building blocks of great cinematic characters. It's pretty much the same thing in real life. Something bad happens to us, and we decide we're never going to let that happen again. But in order to prevent it, we have to be a certain way. We choose the behaviors that we believe will deliver safety, stability, and love. And we repeat them over and over again. In the movies, we call it a character. In real life, we call it personality. How we decide to respond to our fears, that is the person we become. I decided to be funny. Each of my siblings remembers that night in that bedroom with our mother. Each of us was incredibly scared, but each of us responded differently, in ways that would go on to define who we were for much of our lives. Harry, despite being only six years old, tried to intervene and protect our mother. He would do so many times over the coming years, sometimes successfully. But that night, Daddy-O just shoved him away. My brother intuitively got my mother's lesson about pain. Harry had discovered that untouchable place within himself. That place where you could hit him as much as you wanted, but you could never hurt him. I remember him once yelling at my father, You'll have to kill me to make me stop. That same night, my sister Ellen responded by running to her bedroom, curling up on the bed, covering her ears, and crying. Later, she would recall Daddy-O walking by her room and, hearing her sobbing, coldly asking, Now what the <coughs> you crying about? Ellen withdrew, not only from Daddy-O, but from the rest of the family. Years later, her withdrawal would result in outright rebellion. She'd stay out all night drinking and smoking and wouldn't even bother to call to say where she was. If Harry was fight, Ellen was flight, and I became a pleaser. Throughout our childhood, my siblings and I judged one another harshly for our different reactions, and those judgments hardened into resentment. Ellen felt like Harry and I didn't support her. Harry felt that, as the older brother, I should have been stronger, I should have done something, and I felt like their responses only inflamed the situations and made it worse for all of us. I wanted everybody to just shut the up and do it my way. I wanted to please and placate him. 
because as long as daddy o was laughing and smiling i believed we would be safe i was the entertainer in the family i wanted to keep everything light and fun and joyful and while this psychological response would later bear artistic and financial fruits it also meant that my little nine-year-old brain processed daddy o's abusive episodes as somehow being my fault. I should have been able to keep my father satisfied. I should have been able to protect my mother. I should have been able to make the family stable and happy. I should have been able to make everything all right. And it's in this compulsive desire to constantly please others, to keep them laughing and smiling at all times, to redirect all the attention in the room away from the ugly and uncomfortable, toward the joyful and beautiful, it's there that a true entertainer is born. But that night, in that bedroom, with me standing there in the doorway, watching my father's fists collide with the woman I love most in this world, watching as she collapsed on the ground helpless, I just stood there, frozen. I had been scared my whole childhood but this was the first time I had been aware of my own inaction. I was my mom's oldest son. I was less than 10 yards away. I was the only chance she had for help. Yet, I did nothing. It was then that my young identity congealed into my mind. It became encased in a hard sediment, an unshakable feeling that no matter what I have done, and no matter how successful I have become, no matter how much money I've made, or how many number one hits I've had, or how many box office records I've broken, there is that subtle and silent feeling always pulsating in the back of my mind that I am a coward, that I have failed, that I am sorry mom mom, so sorry. Do you know what happens when two people are in charge? When two people are in charge? everybody dies that night in that bedroom at only nine years old watching the destruction of my family as my mother collapsed to the floor in that moment i decided i made a silent promise to my mother to my family to myself one day i would be in charge and this would never ever happen again